Spread the fire, welcome to this emergency episode of SMWX. South Africa has taken Israel to the United Nations highest court. It's a momentous move, it's a bold move, it's a move that has got the South African nation talking, indeed the world talking, and today in this episode we are going to break down exactly what this court case is about, what it means so that you can understand exactly what's happening, we're also going to look at some of the legal implications as well as the geopolitical implications and then we'll think about some scenarios going forward about what this case means. Welcome to this channel. If you're new around here, and I know we may get many international viewers, my name is Dr. Sizwe Mbofu Walsh. Let me introduce myself. I'm a scholar of international relations. I hold a PhD from Oxford in IR. I'm also really interested in the intersection of law and international relations. And on this here channel, we explore largely South African politics through interviews and analysis. But today we're going to be looking at some global politics that implicate South Africa. So just a few caveats, of course, I'm recording this in one take. Uh, it's the day after South Africa's case at the International Court of Justice. If you want me to do a video on Israel's case, then, then let me know as well. But today I'm going to zero in on South Africa's case specifically and look at what was said at the ICJ. This is almost immediately after that. So let's break down where this video is going to go. Firstly, I'm going to look at the background to this case. What is the International Court of Justice? What is the kind of case that South Africa brought to the International Court of Justice? And what is South Africa effectively asking for? Then we're going to delve into South Africa's case itself. What did South Africa actually argue before the International Court of Justice? What evidence did it marshal? And what was its case? After that, and this is something that hasn't been looked at in much depth, is what are the geopolitical implications, especially for South Africa, but also for the US, for Israel, for the global south, for this, this case? What does it mean geopolitically? And then we'll look at some scenarios for the future. What happens if the ICJ rules in favor of South Africa, rules against South Africa, and what could those consequences be? So welcome to all the South African viewers. Welcome to any international viewers. We are the country that drops receipts in court like with Cat Williams. So if you didn't know about South Africa, now you know. Let's get into it. Let's start with the background. The background to this case is really fascinating and we can't understand the arguments that were made in the ICJ before we get exactly what the International Court of Justice is and what the case that South Africa put is. So the first thing is we need to establish what is the ICJ in the first place? What is that place that people were arguing at? This is really the United Nations most high court. It is a court that is linked to the United Nations Charter, which is the bedrock of international law. And there's a major difference that really explains what the ICJ does when we contrast it with another big international court, the International Criminal Court which you may also have heard about. So why was this happening in the ICJ and not the ICC, the International Criminal Court? Well, this is the distinction. The International Criminal Court deals with the prosecution of individuals. So real people walking and breathing, right? So the president of a country in his individual capacity as a person would be brought to the ICC. So in the case that we're looking at, if we were talking about Israel, it would be Benjamin Netanyahu. If it was South Africa, it would be Cyril Ramaphosa as a person before the ICC. The ICJ, by contrast, is the court that deals with interstate disputes. So it's not about individual people who go to courts. It's about South Africa taking the Israeli state to court or vice versa, you know, different, the UK could take the US to court, for example, chance would be a fine thing and unlikely, but you, you get the point. The ICJ is about state disputes. The International Criminal Court is still about what states may have done, but it's about individual responsibility and criminal culpability. So why were we at the ICJ? Because this was a dispute between states. South Africa as a state was saying that Israel as a state 
has violated international law and it wanted to hold Israel accountable as a state rather than the individuals involved. It has also approached the ICC, by the way, in a separate process and we'll see how that becomes relevant to the ICJ proceedings as it unfolds. So that's really why we were at the ICJ. That's what the ICJ is and that sets the, the table for what we're going to dive into here. Now, I've seen many commentators make the mistake of thinking that this case is about whether South Africa is accusing, or the hearing at least, whether South Africa is accusing Israel of genocide. That is not fully true because this is a very preliminary part of this case. The case may evolve into uh, a real inquiry into whether genocide has been committed um, in the Palestinian territory of Gaza, but this is a very preliminary stage within these legal proceedings. And it's really important to understand what this preliminary stage is. In legal language, but I'll explain it in layman's terms, this is called um, the indication of provisional measures. Okay, what does that mean? Basically, it's an interim step. So before we get on to the real questions about whether genocide has in fact been committed, the ICJ makes provision for this interim step where you can halt things, you can stop things while the deeper inquiry is happening. And in order to do that, all you need to do is meet a lower bar of basically whether something might be plausible or not. So the case is not necessarily whether genocide has been committed, although South Africa will go on to argue that and does believe that, but it's about whether it's plausible at the moment that genocide could be happening, plausible enough that certain interim emergency steps to halt what's happening should, should be put in place while the longer inquiry happens. So that's what the provisional measures is about. And that's why South Africa was arguing in court. They were saying, hold on, there's something happening that's very serious. Yes, we may need to have a years long inquiry into exactly what's going on. But in the meantime, in the interim, there's this urgent problem that we, we want the International Court of Justice to stop in the interim. If you're a lawyer, it's kind of like an interdict, uh, you know, an interim interdict kind of thing. Just fancy speak for stopping something while you wait for another thing to happen, which is going to take longer. So South Africa was before the International Court of Justice to look at these interim measures or these provisional measures in ICJ charter speak to halt what's happening in the interim while a deeper process might unfold. And that's what the hearing in the International Court of Justice was about. What law does South Africa claim could plausibly have been broken? Well, it's probably the most important law in international law. It's a violation of the Genocide Convention. This is, of course, a convention with a deep history uh, rooted in uh, the suffering of and the tragic and horrific suffering of the Holocaust. And in 1948, the world came to, together to create this convention so that uh, there would be an international legal instrument to prevent genocide from ever happening again. And South Africa is saying that Israel has breached this convention in multiple ways. And it's at least plausible at the moment that those breaches need an emergency halt and a stop to what is happening in Gaza. So that is the background to the case. Uh, it's worth also noting that this is not as if South Africa woke up one day and decided they're going to take Israel to the ICJ. They did this after taking multiple other steps, um, sending, you know, through diplomatic channels their displeasure to Israel. Uh, Security Council discussions have happened. Uh, there's also the International Criminal Court proceedings. And so part of South Africa's case is, look, we've tried everything else. Now we come before this court because we've also pursued other avenues which have proved fruitless. Cool. So that's the background. We understand where we are. We understand why we were at the ICJ. Uh, some South Africans would joke after our performance and our brilliant lawyers uh, and the way they took to the stage at the International Court of Justice. Let's just move the whole court back to South Africa because 
clearly we run international law. Uh, South Africans, I think this thing must be brought to Bloemfontein. Take it from the Netherlands, bring it to Bloemfontein, and that's where the International Court of Justice should be after, after South Africa's case. Cool, so let's get on to the second part of this video, and that is, what was South Africa's case? How did South Africa argue, and what did it say? Now, you can go and read the arguments in full. Obviously, they took many hours, so I'm not going to repeat everything that was said here. But what I am going to do for you is try to distill and crystallize what the argument is so that you can understand it better when you go to either read or watch the full arguments. Now, I'm not going to do it in the order that the argument happened because I think there's a way to neatly understand what South Africa's case is. See, in any legal case, you have two legs. You have the facts, what happened, and you have to explain and give evidence of what you think happened. And then you have the law. What are the rules around whether what happened is allowed to happen or not? And you can think of South Africa's case on those two legs. There's the factual side of the case, where South Africa tries to allege that what is happening in Gaza right now can be plausibly interpreted as genocide. And then there's the law, the international law, which says these are the rules, specific rules that have been broken. This is why South Africa is allowed to be in this court. And this is why this court has the power to prevent, interrupt or interdict Israel from continuing those actions until a full inquiry ensues. So let's look at those two prongs of South Africa's case and try to understand what was said. So let's look at the facts part of the case. And the facts part of the case, I think you can understand by looking at three of South Africa's lawyers. You can look at Advocate Adila Hassim, SC, who spoke first. You can look at Advocate Tembeka Nukai Tobi, who spoke second. And then you can also look at uh, Senior uh, King's Counsel Ni Grela, who was the penultimate speaker. And I think there's a thread that runs through those. And what's that thread? Advocate Hasim, who spoke first, spoke about effectively, if you distill it all, the actions that Israel has been taking and characterizing those actions as plausibly genocidal. She spoke about the amount of killing that has happened in Gaza. She then spoke about beyond mere death, the amount of just effectively human suffering that has ensued. But also she then spoke about the living conditions for those who are alive, lucky enough still to be alive. And she painted a picture of a factual picture of the killing, the not killing but still suffering and then the living conditions and the infrastructural damage around that. So that was the one factual picture that was painted by advocate, um, advocate Hasim and I thought she was pitch perfect. She set the tone. The team must have been nervous. I mean anyone arguing in The Hague would be nervous but she really came out of the blocks with clarity and clinical precision. So that was the first thing on the facts to paint the factual picture of the human toll of suffering. If we then look further down the case and we look at uh, Nigrela KC, what she did was she painted a picture of the urgency of the situation. So not just that bad things have happened in the past, but if, if the court doesn't intervene urgently, terrible things could keep happening in the future. So you can really link those two arguments around the facts about what's happened in the past and what needs to be prevented in the future about the factual situation on the ground, both tragic mass death, but also infrastructural catastrophe and great suffering for the living. Then let's come to advocate Mukai Tobi as we stay with this basket of interventions on the facts of the case. Because in order to prove genocide or at least the plausibility of genocide in this case, you don't only have to show, and it's not merely a question of the factual situation being dire. 
it's also a question of what was the intention behind the actions of the Israeli state. Let, let me paint this picture for in, in layman's terms, right? If you make a mistake, um, one day you're walking, your foot hits some lever that hits another lever that results in the death of someone, right? That's a terrible thing and the person has died. But your specific legal culpability is different to if you intended to kill that person. That's a much more serious crime because not only are the consequences terrible, but the intention behind the consequences links up. Same in the crime of genocide. It's not just about there being a lot of killing. Um, and remember the definition of genocide is the attempt effectively to exterminate a racial or ethnic group uh, en masse. But it's about whether there is an intention to do that behind the actions. So what advocate Tembega Nukai Tobi's task in the case was, was to say that yes, we've established the, the, the terrible consequences of these actions, but the intention behind these actions was in fact genocidal. The intention was to do the killing because it's an ethnic or a national group and um, those responsible, i.e. the Israeli state, meant to do this. And that's often a really difficult part of genocide litigation because nobody says they actively intend to commit genocide, uh, usually, right? But what advocate Mukai Tobi then did was he, he effectively broke down his inquiry into multiple stages and he said, firstly, we need to look at the statements of senior state officials. So he looked at uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, prime minister. He looked at the president, uh, Herzog. He looked at senior government officials um, like, I believe, the defense minister, Gallant. He looked at the statements of uh, who I believe is the finance minister, Smotrich, and a, a wide range of senior governmental officials and broke down how not private, but their public rhetoric can be linked to an intent to wipe out the, the population of Gaza because it needs to be wiped out and not for some other purpose. Uh, particularly looking at some of uh, these motifs, uh, a biblical reference to Amalek, which is about wiping out all living creatures basically in retaliation to an attack talking about this motif that has run through senior rhetoric about calling the people of Gaza human animals. And of course, we know that part of genocide is degrading the humanity through rhetoric of those that, that are being uh, attacked. So that was the first leg of Nogai Tobi's attempt to create the plausibility of genocidal intent. The second leg was that he drew a link between the statements of senior leaders, because those statements are one thing, and the actions of soldiers on the ground. And he said that the actions of, of those who are on the ground in this, uh, in this moment in history in Gaza, on the Israeli side, have been consistent with those statements from senior leaders and, and various uh, pieces of evidence, such as a, a video of Israeli soldiers talking about how there are there are effectively no innocent civilians in this conflict. So there was this link drawn between what senior people are saying and what people implementing on the ground are doing and saying. And then, interestingly, he also spoke about the public climate within Israel and the kind of public debate and spoke about things like uh, famous musicians and what they have been saying and the media context and the way that in some ways um, he claimed that Israeli media has stoked and um, reinforced the kind of rhetoric that he alluded to in terms of the senior leaders. So basically what Nukai Tobi did was he, he took what advocate Hasim and uh, Nigrela did and then he said within these facts there's also an intention and he painted that thread of intention throughout his, his case and together that really made up the first leg of South Africa's case. These are the facts. This is the evidence that has been marshaled. And again, I commend the videos to you. I commend the transcript to you. 
and I commend South Africa's uh, founding document to you, which is 84 pages, if you want to get into the real details of that. But South Africa effectively said, these are the facts. There's a serious crisis going on. There's serious killing. There's serious infrastructural damage. There's serious human suffering. And there is an intent on the part of those inflicting that suffering to do so for reasons of wiping out that population. And that was the first part of the case. The second part of the case, as we move on, was a legal one. Because that's all well and good, but in the International Court of Justice, you have to prove that you deserve to be there, that the court itself should be the court to hear that matter, and that uh, the case is properly brought. So when you look at um, Professor Dugard, when you look at uh, Max Duplessis, SC, and when you look at the, the sweeping speaker, the final speaker, uh, Professor Vaughan Lowe, they really dealt with marrying the factual situation with the legal requirements for the order that South Africa is seeking before the court. And just briefly, you know, there are a number of things that you, you have to show. I, I want to focus on some of the most important. Um, when, when you hear the word jurisdiction, what that really just means is, does this court, namely the ICJ, the court they were at, have the power to hear and, and, and make a decision on the, on the question? And South Africa had to convince the court that, yes, you are the right court to hear this and you have the power to decide this. And one of the important things, and this is where Max Duplessis came in, was you have to show that there's a link between the rights that you are invoking and the court's power and indeed the, the legal instrument that's being invoked. And early on in, in, his, in his speech, he, he said something quite powerful. He said, really, I mean, the Genocide Convention is front and center of international law and the ICJ, so jurisdiction I don't think will be a big problem. But he said, the right we're invoking here is simply one of them is Palestinians right to exist as people, to be here, their right to be on the earth, basically. Um, so, so that was important from a procedural perspective. Um, then Vaughan Lowe and, uh, you know, Professor Dugard really spoke about uh, the jurisdiction of the court, why the court should be the place to decide genocide and plausibility of genocide. It's done so before. Uh, they looked at previous cases. There's a there's a case right now about uh, Myanmar and the and the Muslim population uh, in Myanmar and how a potential genocide uh, has been happening there. And they invoked that case to say, well, you instituted provisional measures there for these reasons. You had the power to do that. If you had the power to do that, then you have the power to do that to do this now. Now, what Professor um, Lowe did, did quite well, finally, as we talk about just the legal aspects of this case, is to say, why has South Africa brought Israel to the ICJ and not Hamas? Um, and, and I think most commentators, observers, when they look at uh, Hamas's actions, especially on the 7th of November, I believe, uh, have categorically condemned those it's clear that uh, major civilian life was lost in, in heinous and terrible and tragic ways. Um, and thousands of civilians were killed by Hamas um, on, on that day and hostages were taken, etc. And, and, and war crimes um, were committed. But like we said at the beginning, the International Court of Justice is a place for states to hold other states accountable. And Hamas is not a state. There are legal avenues open to anyone to take um, Hamas individuals and leaders to the International Criminal Court. But South Africa in this case is trying to hold the state of Israel responsible for the events following and its, its uh, actions in retaliation to what happened on, on the 7th of November. So Professor Lowe, an Oxford, uh, an emeritus professor of international law at Oxford, said that that's, that's beside the point, really, from a, a legal procedural perspective. 
this court can only decide disputes between states and therefore it would be impossible for any state to bring Hamas to the International Court of Justice. What this court is, to, is required to do is inquire into Israel's actions and put them up side by side with international law and decide whether there's a plausible case that international law has been violated. So really that is an attempt to crystallize and summarize the case for you, uh, to explain what South Africa was doing and from a legal and a factual perspective to try and synthesize all that South Africa said. I think just a note, one thing South Africa does really well is law. We can lawyer in South Africa. We constantly have massive public legal trials, uh, legal hearings, and we are so used as a nation to having, you know, our presidents in court, they basically live in court, like all of our presidents and former presidents, they basically live in court. We're a nation of controversial legal issues, but we're also a nation of brilliant legal minds. And I just want to pay tribute uh, to the South African legal team from Advocate Hasim, who started to Professor Lowe, who swept and everyone in between and all the juniors uh, who didn't speak, but who did the research for this case. I think I just want to pay tribute to the brilliance of their legal submissions and shout out to them. And let's let's get a round of applause in the comments. So having said that, I just want to end off on thinking about some of the implications for the future. There are, of course, legal implications and geopolitical implications. So let's let's think just legally speaking quickly, what could happen with this case? Now, Israel will be arguing as, as I uh, shoot this. And as I say, if you, if you want me to analyze their response to South Africa's case, let me know down in the comments. But when, we, when it comes to provisional measures, as we've already explained, the International Court of Justice tends actually to deliver its judgments quite quickly. So in the Rohingya case, this is the case between Myanmar that was brought by the Gambia. Also interesting, another African country bringing a case to the ICJ about genocide. Um, there was a provisional measure step in that and the judgment came after 42 days and that was like over a uh, over over a holiday period like the provisional measures hearing was in december and we got the the judgment in jan or feb i think so the court can come back within a week within a month within two months and and that's the kind of time frame i would expect for this judgment so where are we right now date wise we're, we're kind of in mid-jan by the end of Feb, mid-March latest, I would expect a judgment on this. And of course, that judgment is going to have far-reaching implications. I think there are the legal implications and whether this can actually be implemented. But the fact of the matter is that there are, there are moral implications to the extent that morality has a place in international relations but there are consequences for the image of Israel, of those who have aided and abetted Israel, especially the United Kingdom and the United States. There are also uh, reputational considerations for the court itself and international law writ large. And this is what some of the lawyers tried to say is that the court has jurisprudence, it has passed judgments, there is a genocide convention and if the court is going to stick to the things it has already said, would the credibility of the court be undermined if it was to double take and, and backpedal and, and uh, go against some of its previous precedents? So there are international consequences for those parties and legal consequences for those parties. What would happen if the court ruled in South Africa's favor? Well, it would really be up to the international community uh, or non-community to implement. And that would be down to the Security Council in many ways. We've seen that various attempts at a ceasefire from both uh, China, Russia and the United States in various modalities have been vetoed by different uh, members of the Security Council, the P5 members. So the implementation is probably not not going to happen quite frankly uh, we've seen these these um, the united states we've seen various countries in the world just flout international law but 
one would be doing, they would be flouting international law very openly and obviously, and that would have reputational consequences. I guess there's something to be said for what are the geopolitical implications for South Africa, because of course, Israel will not be happy with the fact that this case is even happening and that the international scrutiny created by this case uh, has been brought to bear on South Africa. Could there be diplomatic retaliatory measures against South Africa? I'm not, I'm not so sure. And the reason is, look, I mean, it's, it's not going to foster friendly relations between the two countries. But the fact of the matter is South Africa went to court. It's not a violent action. It's not, um, you know, an, an act of intimidation. It's an, it's an attempt to appeal to the so-called rules-based international order and say, hey, here are the rules. This is how we think they were broken. And, you know, if we're wrong, we're wrong. But I would much prefer states to engage in this kind of dispute resolution mechanism than through violence. So I think even though South Africa will face pressure from the US, it will face pressure from the UK, it will face pressure from uh, Israeli allies, from Israel itself, ultimately South Africa has the capacity to turn around and say, well, I mean, we use the order that you claim is, is so amazing. Uh, and, and we're working within the confines of that order. What more do you want us to do? Um, we wish you would use that order more. And um, I think it's uh, you know apt to say that, for example, with the International Criminal Court, not the ICJ, uh, the US is not even a signatory to the Rome Statute. Um, uh, and they haven't ratified the Rome Statute. So do you want the rules-based order or do you not? because we can't have it when it applies, when it's convenient, and then throw it out the window when, when not. Um, look, I think there are also interesting geopolitical implications in terms of, as I say, those who have assisted Israel, because if the court votes for these provisional measures, then it will cast aspersions on those states that have assisted Israel, like the US, uh, like the UK, but especially with the military aid of the US, to what purposes has that aid been, 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 been employed? And to what extent is that evidence of complicity in the plausible crime of genocide at this stage? And that's a real um, international law crisis, um, even if the, the US's power is, is, is great. So there, there will be blowback in, in, in the media um, Western media channels um, will be critical of South Africa, and that's for sure, and that never helps with, with the country's image. So South Africa is weighing all of this up in its balance and saying, on the one hand, we're going to face this diplomatic pressure. We're not going to be very well liked for this particular issue. But remember that South Africa has a wide ranging relationship with the United States. It's not like this is the only issue and, and on many issues they agree. So, so to isolate this and assume that it's gonna contaminate the entire relationship of South Africa and the UK, South Africa and the United States is probably to overstate it. Um, South Africa and Israel already have you know, broken off most diplomatic ties. So not much changes from that perspective. What South Africa is weighing all of this up against is that the solidarity in the global south is going to be at an all-time high. Even in, in Western countries, uh, those who have spoken out against, uh, against the Israeli actions um, have, have had to say, South Africa, wow, this is a big step that you've taken. Um, this, is, this is a great reputational moment for South Africa in the global south. It is the country that has spoken up against this issue when so many countries in the world, the vast majority of the world, um, has criticized the actions of, of Israel in Gaza. So South Africa has to weigh up uh, a minority of very powerful countries not being very impressed with the step, with the majority of the world being very impressed. And, and of course, a shifting world order in which the majority of the world is actually getting more powerful. And South Africa has important trade relations with uh, countries around the world not the least of which the BRICS, the BRICS nations. Um, so if we want to go deep into these geopolitical implications, there's a whole question about what's happening in Yemen now as well, because we've seen that there have been airstrikes in Yemen. We can talk about how that's related to what's happening in Israel, because the Houthis in Yemen 
uh, a group that has gone against the, the, the main Yemeni government for many years now have been, you know, uh, frustrating shipping and sea lanes. And, and this is basically to, to say to any ships that are assisting Israel, the Houthis are going to give you a hard time getting through the Red Sea uh, passage. And now there have been airstrikes uh, by the US, the UK, um, Australia, I believe, was involved. Bahrain was involved on the Houthis in Yemen. So there's a, there's, there's a threat of the, the spread of this conflict and the International Criminal Court uh, ruling will, of course, feed into that wider possibility of a spread of this conflict and will play into that. So lots of com uh, consequences and complications, but I've just given you a sketch of some of the geopolitical considerations. Um, of course, for Israel, geopolitically, this would be a serious blow because they would have many institutions in the, if, if they lost the case. Of course, if they won the case, that's, that's, that's great for them. Um, but if, if they lost the case, many UN agencies would have, would have effectively vocalized their displeasure at Israel's actions, and then you'd have the main international court, um, you know, really going against what Israel has, has done, which is not a good look. So those are some of the implications going forward. Remember that the International Court of Justice is a court, but it's also itself based in geopolitics. So there are 15 judges. Uh, five of the judges have to be, not have to be, but it's become a customary rule that they come from the permanent five members of the Security Council. So the US always has a judge. The UK always has a judge. France always has a judge. Russia always has a judge and China always has a judge. So you've got the five, and then you've got the remaining 10 coming from different parts of the world. And various analysts have looked at this. I would commend a, a, a video by Norman Finkelstein, a US scholar, a pro-Palestinian scholar who's written a lot on Gaza, um, who looked at the geopolitics of this. And effectively, the court looks like it could be split. It'll be interesting to see what, what Russia and China do because they have their own skeletons um, but it's going to be fascinating we don't know which way the court is going to go and when it comes to provisional measures um, the court tends to just speak with one voice um, if it's a merits case then you can have dissenting judgments and all of that but the court's probably going to just speak with one voice so we might not know uh, which judges went which way but it's going to be tight that's for sure and that's just because of the geopolitical way in which judges come from countries and countries have their interests and and may put pressure on judges um, directly or indirectly. So, yeah, let's have a look at this. If there's anything else about this that you want me to analyze, uh, let me know in the comments below. Like, share, and subscribe to this channel, and spread this video as, as far and wide as you can. Uh, shall I, in, shall I um, analyze Israel's case? Shall I analyze the judgment when it comes out? And shall we talk about that? Any other ideas you have, let me know. But today my purpose as a South African geopolitical analyst was to give you my view of what South Africa did, what the International Court of Justice is, what South Africa's case was, and what some of the implications of that case could be in the future. Spread the fire, aye, aye and thank you once again for joining us on this emergency episode of SMWX.